Okay, we're going to try and fix that. <laughs> So for I don't know how many years now, at least 10, you know, I'm fishing bucktails in the Gulf, and I can tell you when people come on the boats that I fish on, um, and you know, they bring bait, we, we laugh, and I say, yeah, okay, but um, we convert them very quickly to jigging uh, Gulf and bucktails. And this is excellent, so I'm, I'm glad to see that, you know, a lot of people haven't seen this, and uh, we can go from there. All right. So, fluke, like when I was growing up, you know, they were kind of almost described as these brown blobs on the bottom. And yeah, you know, when I, obviously, I'm not young, right? So years ago, we all started by dragging bait. One of the first things you had to do before you went fluke fishing, you had to get bait. A lot of times we were dragging for killies and shiners, you know, we are using nets and stuff. And, um, you know, that was always a big part of fluke fishing. Um, but that's changed, and the, and the real, the, best fit for fluke fishing I know these days, they're, they're out there jigging, and they're jigging gulp. And you know, gulp doesn't pay me. You know, I've heard this, I've read this online, oh, Skinner's getting paid. Oh, I, I wish they were paying me. I've sold, I've sold, I'm sure I've sold more gulp than their advertising. Because I know the people who distribute it, and I know the impact that I've had on the sales, but no, I, I don't get anything. All right, so, um, Let's first dispel any myth about it. I'm sorry if you guys have seen, you know, to, to you or have seen this before, but you know, I can watch this crap over and over again. This is, you know, I, this is still very cool to me. Um, so, one of the things I, I've heard people say when I was, you know, getting taught how to blue fish is, oh, you know, give them some time to take the bait. You, you feel the bite, you drop back. And, oh, you, if you have a long strip, you're going to need a stinger hook, or else you're going to miss it. This is the way they feed. They one time, one big shot, they grab the whole thing. Uh, another thing that you're gonna see, and I've watched, you know, I'm showing, I'm gonna show eight minutes or so underwater video. I've watched hours and hours of this, and every fish does what this guy does, is that they, they grab it, and for whatever reason, I don't know what it is, they just keep swimming along, you know. So it's not like they, they hit and they run like most fish. Um, you can see these hits are quite violent. Um, watch what this guy's going to do. They're, they're tame. Um, you got to understand what, what's ahead, what's filming this is a black inline camera. It's not something you would think that a fluke is going to hit, but they're aggressive. There's no hook on that thing, by the way, he can spit that out at any time. Um, it's got a hook protector on there. But he just hit that, and uh, he's got that thing in his mouth, but now he's eyeing the camera. And these are very, very aggressive fish. And after I got to watch some of this video, it, it really has impacted the way I fish for them. I fish for them now like an aggressive fish. Uh, so there we go, any doubt as to what he's doing, you know, I'm gonna stop it here, we're gonna slow mow it. And, uh, here he is, he's going to eat the camera. And, you know, so this is not a brown blob laying on the bottom that, you know, you have to get to suck on your bait or anything. No, they're aggressive predators. They're big predators. Um, another one. This one is swimming away. You're in the fluke's mouth and swimming away with the camera. So this is done to dispel uh, any notion about them being docile or anything. Um, they. They are looking to hit things. So, um, what we're going to get to in a few seconds is what you're seeing here is I'm giving them this one offering. It happens to be a fresh strip of fluke. Um, but now what you're going to see on the right hand side uh, in a few seconds here is I'm going to start bouncing the bucktail. Maybe I'm going to do this other thing first. Okay, so, well, oh, so he's got that thing in his mouth and I had dropped the bucktail rig down and he went over and wanted to grab that as well. Uh, so there's the bucktail rig bouncing. At some point I'm going to get both baits side by side. Um, one of the other things I want to show here is that I often tell people if you miss a hit with fluke, it doesn't matter, they're going to come right back. Uh, what you're going to see on this video is because it has a hook protector and I'm not hooking the fish, he grabs it and uh, it comes out of his mouth and it comes out of his mouth and, and he keeps, keeps going after it 
over and over again grabbing it. And I show this to bring up the point, I've seen this many times where, you know, even in deep water, we might reel a fluke in halfway off the bottom and lose them, just get right back down. That fish very likely is going to hit again, even though he fought it. We've had them go all the way to the surface, spit at the surface, and then turn around and, and grab the bait. Um, so, again, it's, it's, don't worry about setting too early, and we're going to get into you know when to set the hook. Yeah, this guy, he's not going to give up, and that thing's going to come out of his mouth six or seven times. Um, don't worry about setting too early. If you miss him, it's coming back. If you lose a fish, get back down to the bottom right away. Keep jigging because there's a good chance that you're going to be able to get it. Yeah, at that point, I thought the bait was too high. He, he came all the way up and grabbed it anyway. Uh, so after he's done entertaining us, we're going to get to the point where we're going to have now, on the right-hand side of the screen, we're going to have the bouncing gulp rig. And we're going to take a look at that closer. We're going to see using it in a couple of different environments. And this guy's almost done. He's looking like he's exhausted, but uh, and, and yet he still um, has gobbled it up. All right, so I think we're getting into it uh, around now. Also, okay, so here we go. All right, so now we've got the Gulf Rig. And it's, uh, this is Long Island Sound, by the way. This is close to Riverhead. Uh, and I'll say where these things are, are filmed. Um, so you'll see the rig, you know, you've got the bucktail and the teaser. And what I want to show here is I'm offering him a choice. Um, quite a few fluke I'm going to offer a choice here. You've got the dancing bucktail rig. You've got the strip of fresh meat. They are not interested in the fresh meat when they see that thing bouncing. You're going to see over and over. And again, I've watched a lot of underwater fluke video. And they will bypass the meat all the time to hit the thing that's bouncing, the motion. The, the motion is a magnet for these fish. And there's going to be two things that I'm going to mention here that are very important. And the, the, the two points being presentation, which is motion in the strike zone, and drift control. Those are the two most important things in fluke fishing. And you'll see it over and over. Sometimes we've got multiple fish will be following that bouncing bucktail rig while they ignore the fresh strip. So, you know, this is, I, I try to show to the people that still bait fish, um, no, this is going to be a, a better solution. Now, in addition, you know, if you fish with bait, suppose you've got, you know, some uh, shiners or whatever spearing on there, what's going to happen when you miss a hit, right? You, you're going to lose your bait. With the gulf, you really don't. I mean, they might bite the tail off. That guy's actually going to bite the tail off, and it doesn't matter. He's going to come back. I'm going to catch him anyway. Um, what's surprising to me is that I haven't set the hook. It shows you you know, I'm not, I don't even know if he's on there. He's being kind of, so I'll, I'll feel him now, I'll get him. But again, you know, they're going after the gulp. They don't care about the strip. The only time I get them to hit the strip is if I pull that gulp out to gulp rig uh, out of the water. Um, proper presentation, and then the, the drip, and the drip is, is huge, and we're gonna see different ways of doing that. Another thing is structure. You know, you see I'm going over structure. A lot of times these fish are hanging around uh, that kind of structure. And certainly when we fish Montauk or Block Island, we're around heavy structure quite a bit. And that's where those larger fish are. What I found interesting about this, I, I got this wrong, actually. I thought this gulp offering was going to wiggle in the water and look pretty cool. And it, and it didn't because I can't jig it on the camera or else the video is going to be no good. Um, so basically I've got like a blob of gulp on there and what interests me is I'm going to get a fish here that's going to, oh yeah, well they see the bucktail rig so they're going to go all over there. But once I get that bucktail rig out of the frame, then it will hit the thing that's just drifting along. And look, they both have gulp, but the difference is one's dancing around and has all that action. Well, that's the one they want. The one that's just going along like this, um, they're not as interested in it. I'm going to get a fish here after somebody finally grabs that bucktail rig and goes to the surface. I think they have it here. Um, we're going to have a, a fluke come up. And what I found interesting about this is how it evaluates this bait. And what I think is interesting is that, you know, what are they going to do? They're interested in, in smell and in taste. 
and this one's going to get really, really close. I know that it, it's a little bit blurry video, not the best in the room, but you can see the shadow. You can see there's a fish there, hopefully, <clears throat> behind the bait. And he's going to get right up to it. So you know he's getting some kind of scent. And he's going to make a decision that, yeah, that smells good, and, and he's going to eat it. But then the interesting thing is, again, there's a hook protector. I don't want to hook them because it just makes the, the video a disaster. Um, so that gulp thing is going to come out of his mouth again, over and over again, and he's going to keep hitting it. So that tells me two things. Number one, um, they approve of whatever that scent is. And number two, uh, the taste is okay as well because it keeps coming out of his mouth, and even though it comes out of his mouth, he's going to grab it again and again. I mean, if you bit into something, if I bit into a slice of pizza and it didn't taste good, although I can't envision that <laughs> um, but suppose it was a rotten slice of pizza or something, I've never had one, but, um, yeah, I wouldn't take another bite. If this guy, yeah, it comes out of his mouth, he's going to keep hitting it um, over and over again. All right, so let me get my, my organization here, because there's a couple of points that when you're up here, it's hard to not get um, All right, so what I'm going to show is vertical jigging. Uh, so we're, we're pretty much straight up and down, maybe a little bit of scope. Um, the object is to use as light a weight jig as possible without scoping out. Now scoping out means, you know, if you're, you're drifting along, this is always drift fishing. You let your line to the bottom and, and you're bouncing. It's supposed the wind's kind of blowing or something and what's happening when you're drifting is your lure's coming off, your jig's coming off the bottom and you have to keep letting out more and more line to keep it near the bottom. You're gonna watch the angle of your line increase, and that's called scoping out. That's bad because, you know, you wanna get that motion on the jig, but if you've got a huge angle on your line, you're not, all your jigging action, it's not getting the, the motion down to the jig. So, you have to dial in your, your bucktail weight. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, all right, so the things that are important for that, for getting that correct bucktail weight. You're looking at depth, current, certainly the weight of the jig, but you know, it's not just drift speed. It's the speed of the boat, the speed of the drifting craft compared to the speed of the bottom. Imagine you're at 50 feet of water and all the water is moving at three miles an hour. Well, guess what? Your rig's gonna hang straight down. If the boat's moving the same speed as the current at the bottom, then you're all just moving together and everything's gonna hang down. You can probably fish for three quarters of an ounce. What happens is when you have like a breeze or something, uh, that's gonna push the boat faster than what the bottom water is moving at. That's where you start having to think about you know, using a little more weight to stay down and you, you might start scoping out. Uh, actually, when we fish Montauk, there are days where it's glass, there's no wind, it's glass calm. You would think you could fish really light, but Montauk's kind of weird in that you'll have a differential between the bottom current and the top current, and the boat might be drifting faster than the bottom current, and there's, it's glassy water, and you've got six ounces, and you're still not staying down. So again, it's not just your speed, um, it's the differential between the top and the bottom. So they're going up in weight, what about drift song? No, you're right. We're going to get to that. We're going to work our way to that. Um, so, all right, so you know, you got to think about the differential. Uh, now, things that you can do to reduce that scope. What's very important, this is the biggest mistake a lot of people make, is the choice of line. There is no reason to use heavier or thicker than 15 pound test braid. You should never use monofilament. Um, a 15 pound braid, preferably an eight strand braid. Now, there are four strand, eight strand, I think they make some other ones as well, some higher ones, but. Um, the difference is the eight strand braids, and that's just the number of strands are used to braid the line, it's much smoother. What you're looking to do is reduce the resistance of the line in the water when you're drifting. So two ways of doing that is you keep your diameter thin, that's where you're using 15 pound braid, or even 10 pound braid. Some of the guys I fish with use 10 pound test out Montauk. I don't, I use 15. Um, so you want that thin braided line, but the smooth line is, you know, also reduces the drag in the water. Uh, my preference, Berkley X9. To me, that's the thinnest, it's the smoothest. Uh, that's what I use, that's my choice of line for food fishing. Um, okay, rod action, let's get to that. 
Something I often hear people say is, I get all my fluke on the teaser. This is what I hear. If you're getting all your fluke on the teaser, there's something wrong with your bucktail. Most likely it's too heavy. If that bucktail is too heavy, the, the action is very unnatural. You might as well have a stone down there. It's just not getting good action. You want that thing to have some nice, you know, the right kind of fall. Um, so just keep an eye on that. If all your fish are on the, on the, the uh, teaser, think about maybe lightening up on the bucktail weight a little bit. If you know you can do that and still stay down without having to dump a lot of stone out. So you know we're still looking at presentation here. Stop it. Good. All right. So here's the rig. I mean, you saw it on the water rig. Um, there's a loop at the bottom. There's a loop about one foot above that. The bottom loop is a surgeon's loop. The top one is uh, just a drop of loop. You can go online, see many fine videos of how to tie these, so I'm not going to waste time here doing that. At the bottom, you've got a bucktail. On the top, you have a teaser. Um, when I'm fishing the deeper waters, either Conic Bay or the ocean, um, Montauk Block, this is pretty much the rig. At the bottom, that's an s, &S bucktail. Um, a swing hook. Something I want to point out, it's, it's kind of getting into the finer points of things, but you see the position of the hook eye. Some bucktails you're going to see, the eye is going to be here in the center, and that's fine if you're using lighter weight bucktails. It's actually the best if you're using like an ounce, three quarters of an ounce, because you can bounce that guy straight up and down. What happens is if you have to go to like four or five ounces, if that eye is in the middle, um, and you're trying to jig that thing straight up and down, it's hard to put action on it. Again, action in the strike zone. Um, another thing about the bucktails I use in deeper water, they're swing hooks. And what I've seen is, again, if you have a center placed eye and a fixed hook on like a four ounce bucktail, and you're trying to jig that thing straight up and down, it's, it's impossible, you're just not getting any action. By shifting the eye forward and having the hook with a joint where you've got a swing hook, what happens is when you jig it up, it goes like this and it dips and you end up with a dipsy doodle. And I know this is the case because I do have underwater video where I was able to see my jig and go, oh yeah, it does exactly what I would expect it to do. So sometimes people ask me, well, why do you use that kind of jig for this situation? Well, that's why, because I'm looking to get action on those heavier jigs. Uh, for teasers, many fine teasers out there, I really like the Tsunami uh, glass minnows, especially the silicone skirt. Again, for the deeper water, um, you'll see a, a different approach for shallower water. And the nice thing about these rigs is with the loops, very easy to change weights. And it's extremely important because you're going to be changing weights multiple times when you're on the water in most cases because the conditions change, right? The current changes, you usually don't go out and have absolutely no change in anything. And that's it, and both loops are like that. Rod choice. <coughs> this is intentionally, let's see if I can do that, good. Um, what I'm doing here is intentionally overloading this rod. If you're gonna get good action on the rod, then your jigging action has to be transmitted to the jig. If the tip of your rod is too soft, what's gonna happen when you're jigging, the only thing you're doing is you're flexing that tip, that soft tip is taking all of the power out of your jigging. I'm intentionally grabbing the, the whippiest tip rod I have with a four ounce bucktail just to demonstrate that. There's nothing wrong with this rod except that you know I'm intentionally using it for the wrong thing here. Just you see how that, that thing is always bending up there? That's what you want to avoid. You just can't get any significant action on the jig. Um, I use these quantum accurate reels. I've never got a cent from these people, just to, you know, because I know I talk about them all the time. And when I do that, people say, oh, they're paying. Trust me, I, I can't even get these reels from them um, at a discount or anything. So there's a flipping switch. And what that allows, if you put it in the flip position, is when you push that thumb bar, the line goes out. But when you pick up your thumb, it stops. So it controls the clutch with just your thumb. There are very few reels. Lose is another company that makes them that has this feature. And the reason it's important to me is that you know when you're drifting along, you know, you're gonna, especially in the deep water, you're gonna bounce, 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 and you're wondering, well, am I really near the bottom? Well, you might drop a little more line, and, and especially you know, in the deep water, you might have to keep dropping line a little once in a while. And if you don't have that one thumb control of the clutch, well, what do you have to do? You have to, you know, flip a switch and then crank it with two hands to control the clutch. 
this is why I use a flipping switch reel. All right, so now we're going to get into, um, you know, I've, I've talked about presentation, you're going to see more of that, and I want to talk about drift control because it's so important. Ideally, we want to have a drift speed in the range, for me, around 0 0.5, so a half a mile an hour to about one and a half. This I find to be the sweet spot. One mile an hour drift is just awesome. Almost everybody's boats, kayaks, everything else these days have, um, you know, a GPS on there, and you can see the drift speed. Now, all right, so how, how do you get control of this? Because right, you go out, especially if you can only fish on weekends, the wind's blowing, whatever, um, you know, how do you control this? Well, the first thing is that you can do is you, you time it. It's a, it's a timing thing. So let's use the example nearby here, Long Island Sound. Let's say you've got outgoing current. Outgoing current here is west to east. It's going in this direction. So suppose you've got a day with an easterly wind, which is coming in this opposite direction. Well, you don't want to fish outgoing water that day, because if you have the current coming this way and the wind is coming this way, they, they cancel each other out. To do well fluke fishing, you have to have that nice drift, the nice presentation. You have to cover bottom, right? I mean, you know, you, you need to cover some bottom to, to get these. So if you've got the two in opposition, you're not going to do well. However, if you just look at it and go, well, geez, I've got an east breeze today, I'm going to fish incoming. I mean, this is something you know, I, I do all the time. Choose the, choose the drift, um, choose the time you're going to fish in order to have a decent trip. That's one way. I mean, there's, a, there's numerous ways that I'm going to cover. Let's take a look. This is Shinnecock Inlet. I love Google Earth, by the way. Just look at this beautiful picture. I can see all the structure, and we'll get to that in a minute. But if you, this is Shinnecock, or this is Shinnecock, yeah. All right, so um, if you look at this, imagine incoming current, right? Incoming current comes in the inlet. On this side of the inlet, it goes this way. On this side of the inlet, it goes that way. Well, there's an easy one, right? You can choose your current directions. So if I have a wind coming from the west, well, you know what? I'm not going to fish here on incoming because that wind is going to go into the current, cancel it out. However, if I go on this side, well, then I've got a nice trip, right? I've got, and then, by wind, I mean breeze. I mean, wind we're going to deal with in, in a minute. But if you've got air movement, you know, going in one direction, well, in this kind of situation, you can choose the direction of your current. So that's, that's very important. I'm going to show another place we can do that. I live out here, somewhere over here, in, in Greenport. And um, if you look at, as the water snakes around Shelter Island, suppose I've got um, a wind coming in, like, from this direction, which is kind of like north-northwest, and I have incoming current. Well, here, the current would be coming in this direction, the wind would be coming in this direction, they cancel each other out. However, I can just run around to the other side, and if I've got the wind coming down this way, well, at Greenlands on incoming, it's, it's going right along with the current. So again, by knowing your area, you can choose your current direction. All right, so let's see other ways you can do this. John, where do you get the wind forecast to plan your outing, you know, a few days before? That's a good question. Windfinder uh, is what I use. Now, there's other apps out there. Magic Seaweed, I think, is one of them. Windy is another one. Um, but yeah, Windfinder. Because the reason is, if you go on NOAA, you're going to see, first of all, it seems like it's always 5 to 10. But if you go It's a big joke among us. You know, you look at Long Island Sound, 5 to 10. It's blowing 25. No, it's 5 to 10. I believe so. I guess it's slightly. So I found one of their weather balloons in the time. And I worked, before I retired, I worked at Brookhaven okay, Land. The NOAA Weather Service was about 2,000 feet from my office. So I went down there with their work, with their weather balloon. And you can't normally get in the building. Of course, they let me in, because I had their thing. And uh, I said, where's the guy who does the marine forecast? And they said, oh, he's this guy over here. This is a guy in, in his cubicle, chewing his pretzels. And so I said, why? <laughs> And he said, oh, you know, he said, the forecast area is really large. He says, I bet you it's some time during that period, in that range, it's going to fly by. I need to make it up. All right, all right let, let, me, let me go on. All right, so another, another thing you can do, like, 
sometimes there's structure that can mess with the current. You know, I showed that green port thing, we're basically still in, we are in green port here. Um, when you've got that current meandering, hitting points, hitting jetties, uh, sometimes you develop eddies. So as it turns out in Greenport, which is down, down in this section here, on incoming, you get an eddy. Now this requires local knowledge, but you learn it pretty quick when you go out and the water is all heading one way, except if I go over there, it's heading the opposite direction. Well, you keep that in your mind. Um, Greenmont is another place that sets an eddy up. There's a lot of places in Long Island Sound, and I use this for black fishing, that will set up eddy well, as well. Eddy means it's the current's going in the opposite direction that you know, you'd expect it to go based on the current, um, you know, the, the tide. Uh, so again, you can choose your drift direction to some extent with local knowledge. Um, so let's go. What's next? All right, we're going to actually fish. All right, so. I, I'm showing this because you know, here I am, Port Jeff. This is Long Island Sound. Uh, this is one of the shoals out here. Uh, all right, it's buoy five. It's a different. So this is buoy five, um, and uh, I'm putting on four inch. So what I'm using now are basically I use two different things for the fluke. I use the four inch grubs, which are only out a couple of years now, and I use the six inch grubs. In the sound, I use the fours. Um, in, I also use them in Shinnecock, in the bay, but out in the ocean I'm using the six inch. So you saw the rig there. In this case now I'm in about 20 feet of water. Don't worry about the trolling motor at, at this point. I guess I'll, I'll mention it. All right, it's okay. I'll, I'll circle back around to not eating it. Um, one of the things I want to point out is I'm in buoy five. There's nobody out here and I'm going to be bailing fish on, on this clip while I talk through a few things. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I've fished the sound a long time, and the fishing, the fluke fishing, like the last four years, has gone down tremendously. Now, do other people have that experience? Yes. 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 It's, it's, I want to use that. It's big. Um, now, that's why there's no boats here. But I do poke out there once in a while. I poked out there this day because it's out of my way now. In Greenport, I got to go to Manitou, run my boat back west. Uh, but I'm actually using the trolling motor at this point to um, get my drift direction in the right direction with the trolling motor. And I'll talk about this as one of the things, tools that you can use to always have your drift right. And the fluke fishing is so good that one of the things I do with a trolling motor, whether I'm just free drifting or I'm using it in some other capacity, um, is when an, if, if there's no other boats around, I'm not in anybody's way, I'll hit spot lock, which you know, stops the boat. When I get a fish, this way here, you know, I get a fish and hit spot lock, I'm not losing any of my drift. I get the fish up, I deal with them, I throw them back, I take it out of spot lock, I continue the drift. The fish was so thick over here, that double header was caught on spot lock because I stopped the boat and I said, my God, these fish are so thick. Uh, let me see if I just drop the, the rig down at anchor. Can I, and I drop it down and I got a double header. Um, you saw me applying scent to something. I do experiment. I would love there to be an alternative to gulp that was more durable, cheaper, etc. So this is a lure I use in Florida a lot with the scent. And I said, hey, now's the time, and these fish are chewing. So I took that lure, put it on the teaser, um, which had been catching most of the fish on this trip. And um, you know, I put the scent on, and yeah, sure enough, I put it down, and the first one I got was on that lure, and I was like, huh. But then, as it went on, you know, eight fish later, it was the only one. Uh, they just wanted to go. And that's what I have found every time I've tried numerous different alternatives and scents with the paste, with the oils. None of them seem to work. Um, but yeah, I'm bailing fish, buoy five. I have a dozen keepers. I'm not yeah, honest, I'm by myself. I've got 12 keepers on this trip. And it, it's basically lock and load fishing, like it used to be. The difference was, you know, years ago, years ago when it was really good, you had a lot of birds, like, and, and sand eels. Your boat was coated with sand eels when you were done. It didn't happen as much this trip, but the fish were, were clearly there. Um, all right, so I'm in about 20 feet of water, a one ounce bucktail, and my teaser is just a 3 0 uh, Gamakatsu octopus hook, a bait holder. Um, 
Well, a lot of times in these settings, I'll just go to the octopus hook. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say octopus. Bait holder. John got some bait holder hook, 3.0. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it slides out. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, don't give up locally. It's, it's kind of easy to do, but this, this trip was, it was ridiculous. Um, we're gonna move out of it. Okay, let's stop. Okay, so we're back to this rig. What do I want to say? I guess because we're going to go a little bit heavier now. Um, Leave it here. Good question. Thanks. Um, 30 pound test fluorocarbon. I prefer uh, Seaguar. Um, Seaguar makes an inshore fluoro that's a lot cheaper than the blue, and I have not seen a difference in performance. In fact, I think it's more abrasion resistance, resistant, which is really why I use fluorocarbon. I have flute aren't really mine shy, but um, get a lot of abrasion and fluoro. I believe. Do you bump it up for the ocean? Or no, 30 for the 30, sound? You know what, I, I used to use 20 in the sound, I just use 30 for everything, it's just easier. Because they're, they're not line shy, so all my rigs are like that. All right, so we're back to rig in the drift control uh, thing. All right, look at these conditions. Yeah, you can see even on this video, it's windy. Uh, I, this is at a point where I did not have a trolling motor. So I've got a 44 inch drift sock on my previous uh, 16 foot boat and um, this makes all the difference. There's, this is uh, behind Reedport, usually there's a lot of boats around, but there's nobody because uh, the drift is really difficult. However, just using the drift sock, and it's an aluminum boat, nothing blows quicker across the top of the water than an aluminum boat. Um, yeah, you know, this was enough to slow me down and, and get me into some really good fishing. See, there was a, there's the oyster factory. So actually, I guess they say I'm kind of almost like off East Marion. Um, you see the jigging action. You're gonna, you know, you've already seen some. By the end of my talk, you will have seen a, a bunch of different uh, clips of jigging action. But hey, there's quality fish here. Oh, one of, one of the things I wanted to point out, I see this slick while I'm reeling this fish in. You see this shiny spot here. You can't see it on this video, but you can trust me, there's a rip there. Actually, I think I can't see it. I'm fishing a slice of water here. If I move in, if I move closer to shore, the drift is actually quite slow. If, and it's bordered by this slit, you can see it behind me. If I go out where that rip is, which you probably can't see on the video, it's flying. It's like three miles an hour. But in this slice of water that's maybe, I don't know, 150 feet wide or so, uh, the drift is pretty good, especially by knocking the wind down with the drift side. So those are the things I want to point out. I point out you can choose where to fish in terms of the current direction. Uh, you can choose slices of water. You can slow your drift with a drift side. Nothing beats a trolling motor. Um, this is behind Greenport again. These are, these are disgusting conditions. I've got a wind coming in 20 miles an hour from the east while the tide's going out, so the wind is blowing completely opposite. It's almost easier when it's completely opposite with the trolling motor. I just set that uh, thing on autopilot and it just tracks. I tweak the speed and, um, you know, it, it's, it, you're, you're fishing and there's nobody out there, right? Because you don't have the trolling motor. If you don't back troll, that's another way. Um, you know, you could use uh, your outboard. I find it really annoying to do that because your outboard is trying to, to do this, you know, just because it's so slow. Some guys I know will like use their boat and kind of back troll into the wind in order to generate that drift. Um, I had mentioned when I showed that rod with that tip that was very light. Um, so what I've done, then I showed where I was catching fish blue five. It looks like I'm using the same white rod. Well, I'm using one of them, but what I had done was I cut the tip. I cut, I don't know, six, eight inches off the tip in order to get the action that I wanted. And for years I was doing that. I was taking the tsunami rods and cutting them, the nexus I was cutting, so I'm trying to get the right rod until finally Josh and Jane H said, no, John, we could just make rods for you. And I was like, well, why don't we do that? And uh, so it took like three or four prototypes. So. And look, I'm not going to try and sell you rods, but uh, my preference is for the rods that um, dark matter is made for me. Because look, if somebody made rods exactly the way you wanted them, I guess you'd probably like them. So that's you know what we have here. This is the rod that I use in, uh, I'll use this in Botanic Bay. It's the dark matter, jig and bounce, I think it's, it's an H. Uh, it's the original that, that came out. Um, 
And what I like is that it's got some spring to bounce that jig, but the tip doesn't suck up all the, all the pressure, and it's got a nice parabolic bend. So when you hook that fluke, especially in the ocean, those doormats, they shake, and they shake that jig right out. This rod is a little bit of a shock absorber on those. So that took it like a year and a half to get that rod right. It's been very popular, it's sold out of it all the time. Um, but um, we're gonna see another version of that. Let's take a look at, again, getting up on the aerials, getting up on um, Google Earth. What's cool about this, and it's, you can't see it as well looking at this, but you can see the structure in another part of Shinnecock. You can see something here. Um, you can see all of the structure. So suppose you're looking at a new area you've never fished before. And this is how I learned Shinnecock, was I went up on Google Earth, you know, Google Earth, you can pull the GPS coordinates and you can manually enter them in your machine and you go out on the water in a spot you've never been before and you can find these places that you've identified from the sky are, are looking good. Um, and certainly structure is one thing, but hey, if you've never been to Shinnecock before and you see all these boats are drifting here, uh, fluke, well, you kind of know, but you don't need the boats to tell you. You see the channel, you see the bars. So I just want to point out the value in the shallows of using something like a to pick the spots. All right, so we're back on, um, so this is Shinnecock Bay. This is back west of the bridge. And what I want to mention here, um, first of all, that rod is a lighter version of the dark matter rod that I just showed, um, is that one popular? So I do a lot of fishing in the sound and in the bay and I wanted a lighter one, so we came up with a lighter one, it's, it's great. Uh, I think it's called the, you know, it's the M or the M, I'm not sure what it is. But it's a jig and bounce, dark matter jig and bounce. And you got a power handle on that active restraint. Yes, uh, I don't think on, on that one, do I? I thought I saw it. Um, yeah, in the ocean, I put in the power handle on the Acuris. In the sound or in the bay, a lot of times I, I don't put this power handle on there. It is, I must have grabbed one of my ocean reels and stuck it on there. Um, but you can see that nice parabolic bed and says it's really great. But I'm not trying to sell the rods here. What I want to point out was this particular day, I crushed the fish. But what had happened is whenever I, I fish Shinnecock and Marigis, because you guys are local in this area, you, I find it that you really need to kind of target that the incoming water, because what happens is the water on outgoing is just dirty and, and, and cruddy and a lot of times weedy. When I first went out on this trip, for whatever reason, the incoming didn't quite get going when I expected it. And the water was kind of dingy. It was um, it was a little warmer, I forget what it was, 75 degrees or 76. And then after an hour or so, you could see the water starting to get clear. I could see it was getting cooler on my GPS, and the place just absolutely lit up. The funny thing is, there's no, like, nobody else around. You know, it's like they started and kind of made the decision that, oh, the fishing's not any good. But you want to kind of time with these inlets, Shinnecock Bridges, these bays. Really, I find the last three hours incoming, maybe the first 90 minutes outgoing, and then a lot of times you get that outgoing water, and um, I've had only, you know, fair uh, success doing that. Um, this kayak's got a trolling motor integrated into it up there in Minnesota. I'm not using it here. I'm, I've got a nice trip. I've got a nice situation where I've chosen a day with light westerly, and I've got outgoing water, so I have a nice natural trip. I don't have to use the trolling motor to compensate. Um, a little bit about, let's get out to the ocean. Uh, these big flukes are around the structure. And if you want to put bait down here, I just want to show how many inter interference fish are down here. If you want to catch fluke, you're going to lose a lot of time. If you put squid down here, these guys are going to kill you. And you're going to spend a lot of time all of those things to the surface instead of fluke fishing. So I just want to point out in the underwater video, by the way, that's 85 feet of water are right. Um, and you can just see how many sea bass, corgis, whatever. This is going to be hard to see. Off to the right, between two rocks, it looks like a gap in the rocks, all the way to the right. It's not the bottom. It's a, this is the one time I got a doormat on the camera. And it's just, you know, I mean, it's just cool, you know, it's a cool video. Except there is actually one educational thing. Look at that jig. It's a floating jig head from Jiggy World. It looks to me like an orange top and the hair looks, looks brown. 
And we're going to get to see the difference in color of what things really are. But yeah, I just wanted to show this guy just because it was like it was a piece of the bottom that all of a sudden just materialized and turned into a big flute. Um, yeah, and then these guys. Are, that's what it is. The hair and the jig were pink. The hair turned brown and the other thing turned um, orange. If, when you're on the, look, when you're in the sound, when you're in the bay, a lot of times the action is, is pretty quick, right? So, you know, you, you put a gulp down the air and, yeah, with a minute or two, you know, you're gonna get something. See, Robin, a short fluke, a regular fluke, whatever. Um, but when you're in the ocean, sometimes the fishing's pretty slow. I mean, you can have, even Montauk on a good day, those fish don't get through the whole tide. They have their little periods of like 90 minutes where they turn on and, yeah, you know, it's great, and then you might go a couple hours where it's terrible. Um, that's a whole other story. But uh, this is what my ocean reef would look like, and what I want to point out that when you're in those situations where there, you know, the bite is not great, you really need to be recharged. And that jar has gulp juice in it. Just buy the gulp juice, and and just keep. And you know, every time you go up for another trip, the rig goes back. The whole rig goes in the jar with the gulp juice every single time. And I know this makes a difference because what happened was I started doing this, but I didn't, I don't know why they didn't notice, but the other guys on the boat, and I'm talking about over a series of months and numerous trips, they didn't, I didn't mention it. I was just doing it. And I was doing so much better than them. And finally one day I said, hey guys, you know, this is what I'm doing. So then they started recharging and right away, I was like, why didn't you tell us? Well, then I, then I don't have a control, right? And for the experiment, you know, if I told you guys and everybody did it, we wouldn't know whether it was really working. But yeah, it's, it's working. Hey, it's, it's really, it's really important to do that. John, what yeah. containers do you use? They don't need coaches. <laughs> so the ones he used, and I don't have, a, I don't go to Costco. They Costco sell desert nut jars, and everybody I fish with uses them. But I, I broke mine, so I had to use this other thing. This is Halkius as a lawyer came up with this jar. And I don't think he's doing anything with it, but he gave me some. And, and it was for this reason. It had a funky top, I just used it like this. But yeah, the, the uh, nut jars at the, um, and Costco were, were really well. Okay, so we are ocean fishing here. Um, and I just want to point out, uh, I've mentioned that you know, if you go out to these good spots and the fishing isn't good, or if you get in a bite and they stop, look, if you're catching fish, um, you really, I, I try not to leave fish to find fish. If the bite shuts down, I would stay on those grounds um, a little bit longer. Scoping out is often an issue here. We sometimes have to go to six ounces. This is where it's really important that you use that thin braided line, preferably something like X9. That's very smooth. Um, and you know what? If you scope out too far, just reel it in, reset, do it again. Um, and you know, to have have the right rod to scope load up, because yeah, you can see there on those, you know, with those big heavy shakes, boy, if the rod is too stiff. Oh boy, so, so many decent fluke lost in that circumstance. What I want to point out is the netting. I've seen some very, very nice fish lost at the net. The, it's usually, to me, it's the guy on the rod. It's the fault of the guy on the rod more than it is the net. There's got to be good communications between the guy on the rod. He's got to be telling the guy with the net. I, you know, what he's doing, you know, I'm not ready, okay, now, you know, and the guy with the rod, I'm going to say uh -huh. something about this in a second, the guy with the rod needs to put that fish in the net, try to drill it in, and the way that one came up, it was hard, most of the time you drift it along, and you've got that fish coming, say to the next guy, okay, here we go, boom, and it, it makes a big difference. The worst is, somebody gets the fluke up to the top, and they stop, that fluke just back pedals and freaks out, goes backwards, and, and that's how I see them see them lost. We, we, we were doing well here. Hey, that jigging, that rapid jigging, very tiring. I had these kids, I, they had me out to teach their kids. It, it doesn't matter, you don't have to rapid jig, you have to have movement. I got this kid, I don't know how he's, he's eight years old, and he, he's happy, he's happy. This, what he's doing, it's very easy, he's jigging a four ounce jig at 85 feet of water, He's got the physics down perfectly. Bump, 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 bump. And he's just catching. Now, I had this kid out again this year, and uh, it was a couple years later. 
and uh, he actually got a nine and a half pounder on a trip with us. He's, he's just gotten better and better. But you know, my point is, if you find that rapid jigging to be tiring, you don't have to do that. Just get motion. What that kid was doing was just fine, and he was out fishing the adults on this, you know. And then they start doing this, you know, rod jigging. <laughs> Don't stop, you know, they're looking at him now, going, what's he doing? Um, and, you know, and so he's got a decent fluke there, but this isn't even the big one. Um, I had him and his, his cousin is like the same age, and, you know, of course, he then was doing the same thing. And this is just great. This fluke is great for kids, you know? I, I like having kids out for fluke. And uh, so nobody on the boat has ever seen one this big before. And uh, they walk backwards, walk backwards, and then, you know, they jump in, you know, <laughs> you know, this kid just won the Stanley Cup over here. <laughs> so, you know, my point is motion in the strike zone, however, is more comfortable. All right, I prefer bait casting stuff is the last clip I'll show. Um, a lot of guys do prefer spinning gear, I get it. So we did come out with a spin version of that rod. I prefer rods are a little bit shorter. Um, so this is like 6.6, but it's got the same kind of action. Halkius, the guy I fish with, does very well. Um, a lot of times with just a jig, no teaser, that's what this is, just a bucktail, uh, two or three ounces, no teaser, you know, whatever kind of action you're comfortable with. What I don't like about the spin gear is that whereas with the accuracy I can hit my the thumb and let line out with the spinner. If you want to let out line, you've got to flip that veil over and, and let it out and engage. But um, you know, spinning gear is I know some very good fishermen, especially on the party boats, where some underhanded casting uh, can make a big difference. That's where you know this rod came in. I, I know some party boat guys that really like this for that. But um, I just want to point it out. You know, spinning gear is good for this too. It's, it's not just uh, convention. So where are we at here? We're at 11:05. All right, I think we can. Uh, I think we can call it there. So let's find one thing here. Let me pause um, before I take the questions. Yeah, I was putting a lot of stuff at the end. Okay, so um, I am. I have, my, I have my table. Got my flute book. Got my other books, including my new one, Fishing the Edge: <laughs> Techniques and Tales from Surf Boat and Kayak. Uh, also. Um, in the association with Soul Strong, which is Florida based, I have a series of online courses, including Fluke, and I am good to take questions. Excuse me, I know you got rods and blackfish jigs, I bought, but uh, do you sell Fluke rigs? Oh no. I don't sell Fluke rigs, but SNS, he'd kill me if I hadn't mentioned it. SNS uh, makes the Fluke Bucktails with my name on it. The, the swing hook, the fixed hook, all of those. Uh, but I don't sell the rigs. They're so easy to tie. You know, two loops. And yeah, so uh, SNS has all that stuff. And he's got a table here. Do you use 30 pound floral to tie those? Yeah, 30 floral on, on the rigs. Uh,